Hello and welcome to Pod Rocket. Today I am here with Jonathan Rienink, who's the co-author of Tailwind and the creator of Inertia JS. How are you doing, Jonathan? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Ben. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you. Um, you know, we'll probably talk both about Tailwind and also Inertia. And Tailwind, I'm going to be honest, I, I hear a lot about it, but I've never really looked into it that much. So I'm excited to learn from you because I do hear a lot of people talking about Tailwind. Um, so maybe we start we start with Tailwind and circle back to Inertia a bit later in the episode. Yeah, sounds awesome. Um, so can you just give us like a quick overview for folks like me who have never used Tailwind? What does it do? How does it help you build great front-end applications? Yeah, so um, I, I'm maybe a little rusty on my my elevator pitch on this, um, <laughs> <laughs> but let me do my best here. So uh, I would say kind of like at its core, um, the way we kind of pitch Tailwind is we call it a, a utility-first CSS framework. And it's utility first in that the way you build your website um, is using all these really small CSS classes that focus just on specific properties and values in CSS. So kind of one that's like the classic one that you've maybe seen in the past, even on non-utility you know utility style frameworks, is like the text center utility. You, you, you put text dash center as a class on some element in your HTML. And now that text is centered. And then, you know, kind of in the early, you know, early on as me and Adam were building the framework, or even before me and him started working on it together, this was kind of an approach that he was experimenting with. And he kind of like pushed it, like, what can we all do with this? And he started doing things like margin. Margin's a really natural thing to use utilities for. So you'd have something like margin dash top, you know, four, and that sets a, a top margin of whatever value your four is, is kind of referencing. And, and what he kind of realized was that this whole technique works for a lot more than just basic things like centering text or setting margins or making something bold or whatever it might be. And you can actually kind of like take this to an extreme and use this technique to build your entire website. And there's all sorts of like interesting things that kind of like fall out of this technique. Um, but kind of at the heart of it, the one thing that like really, really stood out to me when I first started using this, Adam was pulling me, kicking and screaming. He's like, John, you, you need to try this technique. Um, and I'm like, I came from like way more of a classic style background of, you know, doing like BEM style where you write everything actually in CSS and you, you give it names and, and you create modifiers and kind of like that really established approach that a lot of people were using, you know, um, you know, a decade ago already and, and are still using today. I came from that angle. I was like, is this approach like is BEM, is that approach even really broken? So I was kind of like a skeptical, which I think a I think we run into that a lot even today. People are skeptical at first when they see Tailwind CSS. But anyway, so the thing that stood out for me was how fast I was using Tailwind and use, using this utility approach to building websites. And the big thing, the big, big thing that I just absolutely loved was that I was able to stop thinking about naming stuff. Um, this is always like the crippling thing. Um, you're building a new component. It's some, you know, maybe it's a header on the website. Maybe it's some sort of card or a form or, or whatever it is, a team layout. And you're like, okay, I'm going to go to my CSS file. And the first thing I need to do is I need to give this thing a good name because, you know, we're software developers and we've learned the importance of naming things. But when you're just trying to get a site built and you're just trying to, you know, create this design, spending all this time naming really slows you down. Um, and so what with Tailwind CSS, you really don't name things anymore because you're working with all these utility classes and you instead just drop those right into your HTML and it kind of like removes this whole need to, to name things. And that was just so empowering. And then the things you end up, like you still end up naming things, um, but it's like farther down the line and only when necessary. And, and what I mean by that is with Tailwind, where you create your abstractions changes. And I, I got to be careful how deep I go kind of like <laughs> here and you to, but just to kind of like flush this out a little bit further, 
normally like with kind of the BEM style of approach to building a website, you're creating your abstractions in CSS. Whereas with Tailwind, you, you don't do that. You just add all these classes to your HTML. And then when you want to create abstractions, you actually create those abstractions using some sort of like templating tool um, where you actually move your HTML or whatever, and you create, a, you create your abstractions in the form of components. So kind of like the classic examples of this would be, you know, maybe you're creating a form and you're like, okay, you know, let me, sim- let me go simpler than a form. Maybe you're creating a button, right? And your button's like text center, BG, red, you know, 600, text white, you know, font bold, you know, padding this. And you're like, okay, well, I know that I want to use this red button in like 30 other places in this particular application. And I don't want to have to repeat those classes every single time. For me, the the way I approach that is I'll create a button component in Vue or React, or even if I'm using a server-side uh, templating framework, like ERB templates in Rails or in Laravel, something like uh, Blade templates. These, these tools all have forms of creating these components and these abstractions. So you basically move those abstractions elsewhere and it just feels a lot more natural. Um, and, and you're creating those abstractions often anyway in your, in your, with your HTML. So, yeah, so that's kind of like the thing that really just felt great for me. I love that you could essentially start developing in the browser because you have all these classes available and you can just start adding them to your HTML and, and your design just kind of starts coming together in front of you. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if that gives you a bit of a sense of kind of what Tailwind is and kind of like the big benefits to it. Um, it's something we often tell people that the thing that people see is they look at it and they see this HTML and this HTML has all these classes and people get really, you know, who are not, who haven't tried it. It, it can be a bit of a turnoff, which, uh, which I totally get cause I felt the same way. Um, but you know, once you tried it and I always say that to people like don't knock tailwind CSS until you've actually tried it on a project. Cause you really have to experience the workflow to truly appreciate what it's like to work with and kind of the benefits. Yeah. And I mean, lots of people, uh, lots of people knocked uh, HTML and JS, so to speak, you know, the early days of React when JSX was kind of first coming out as a paradigm. And now that's a a widely loved paradigm. So I think, uh, yeah. And yeah, if there's like, Oh, yeah, sorry, I was going to say that's that's a good lesson right there. Like I think, you know, as we push forward on any new technology, you know, at first things can look different and weird and that can be intimidating. But I think as developers, it's always I feel like it serves us well to like not be turned off just because something's different and to like to give it a chance, especially if you get a, a huge amount of people saying, no, there's there's some serious merit to this approach to building websites or web applications like keep your mind open because that's the way you learn and kind of see new opportunities. And I'm curious, like the idea of having these utility classes that out of the box give you a lot of functionality that you can start adding into, into your HTML and, you know, quickly wire up the interface of your app, like reminds me a bit of the pitch of like bootstrap or foundation or some of those older kind of uh, CSS frameworks. So I'm curious are, are there any um, you know, any areas of, of those tools that you or kind of paradigms to those tools that you brought in to Tailwind? Any similarities, differences? Yeah, so absolutely. So Bootstrap, I would say, is we have a lot of respect for Bootstrap, and you know it's a massive project, and and it's really had, like had a huge impact on the internet in general. It's it's crazy. I, I forget the stat, but I heard the other day how many websites on the internet are run on bootstrap and it's it's a mind-boggling sort of number it's a little bit like how many websites on the internet are running on wordpress you know even though you know everyone disrespects wordpress but you know a massive portion of the internet runs on it so yeah so for sure like with bootstrap in particular um what we were noticing and i'm trying to remember if it was like version three or maybe the the dev version of bootstrap four kind of the early alpha release we were seeing more and more utility classes appear uh, actually in Bootstrap at that time, in particular for things like um, text center, font weights, margin, padding. And it was funny because like I was still had 
bootstrap projects that I was working on myself, like older projects before we even had Tailwind. And I would go back to those projects and I, I would want more of those utilities, but bootstrap kind of has a more limited set of what it does with those utility classes. So the, but the, you know, the real big difference between a framework like bootstrap and a framework like tailwind is that bootstrap aims more to be like a component framework. They want to give you a whole bunch of ready to go components, you know, be that a modal or an input or some sort of table design buttons, you know, kind of all the things that you'd expect in a typical web application. Bootstrap is a lot more opinionated in terms of design. You're working with components, you know, and we kind of thought early on more about Tailwind as a lower level than that. We actually said that you could theoretically build something like Bootstrap with Tailwind. So Tailwind is very unopinionated in terms of the, of design. We don't give you really any ready to go components at all. We just essentially give you these classes that link to these CSS properties and values. And that's, that's very much different than Bootstrap. Bootstrap has a distinct look and feel um, that Tailwind doesn't. So yeah, definitely got inspiration from that. I would say that Tailwind, uh, sorry, that Bootstrap's more of a, more in line with our paid product, which is Tailwind UI, which provides a bunch of ready to go components. That's kind of a better comparison. And yeah, like maybe another example of that would be like Balma and, and similar frameworks like that. Yeah. And I guess like when, when Bootstrap came out, that was, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, predated React and Vue and the modern kind of view layer framework. So my guess way back then, there was more need for an opinionated way of doing these common components like a button or a modal. But totally. Yeah. So curious to learn a bit more about Tailwind UI. You mentioned um, is that a, that's a paid product kind of built on top of core Tailwind and um, curious. Yeah. Curious what that. Yeah, does. for sure. So, so Tailwind UI is really our answer to um, people who would start using Tailwind, and they'd be like, "This is, you know, Tailwind's great, but I still have all these. I'm still not a, maybe a designer, and I still want to make my website look nice. I'm creating some, you know, website or some sort of like web application, and I love working with Tailwind because of all the freedom and how easy it is to make changes using these utility classes." But I feel like I need to keep using Bootstrap because I'm not a designer and I need help, you know, designing components. So Tailwind UI was really our answer for that. Um, it basically gives developers just a huge library of ready to go uh, HTML, basically uh, components. That's really the deliverable HTML. It's not entirely true because we do offer React and Vue versions. So there's like JSX versions and kind of like the Vue component version. But it's essentially what we're selling there is HTML, which is a, very much a similar story to what Bootstrap is doing. But the really cool thing I think with Tailwind UI, which I feel like makes it unique, is because it's built on Tailwind is it's extremely easy to make changes to these components. And so this was something that we really felt and myself as a developer back when I was using Bootstrap more often is Bootstrap was great when it just, they kind of had the components that you actually needed for your project. But the second you sort of needed to veer from what they offered and you started to need to make, you know, started to have to make changes either in like the overall branding and look. So in terms of the colors and stuff or like more in, uh, significant changes in terms of like how a component or an input or a button or whatever looked, the customization story was really, really difficult. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever worked with Bootstrap, but their customization story is you basically have like a page or two or three of variables. And I think back in the day, there were SAS variables that maybe they still are. And you could go through and you could start making changes that way, which was neat. It was neat that they made that possible, but it was always terrifying because it's like, okay, they would have the, these padding variables. And it's like, okay, if I make a change to that padding variable because I want to modify this button or this import or whatever else, you were never like totally sure like what that was going to like all impact throughout the rest of the website, right? Whereas Tailwind's like components and ta the Tailwind UI components really don't suffer from this problem because all the components are just built with these low level utilities. So what you do is if you want to make a change, you, you copy the component from Tailwind UI, you know, let's say it's a button, and then you paste that into your 
application in your view or react or just your HTML file. And you're like, well, you know, I actually want this component. It has rounded corners, like kind of like small rounded corners. Maybe I want large rounded corners, or maybe I want like a full pill style or whatever. You can just go to that HTML. You'd modify that HTML right there and you're done. Like it's not going to, it's not going to, you know, have any impact on any other area of your application. It's really nice that you can just like make these tweaks to it. And then you can like take that to like much bigger, you know, extremes. So if it's a table, you can, uh, you can add, um, yeah, maybe you, you add stuff in those tables that wouldn't normally, you know, that we don't ship in with in Tailwind UI, uh, images, you know, drop downs, whatever, because you're just working with HTML using Tailwind kind of as this base to style it. It's really just so easy to make customizations. And that was like, that was like the big win that we saw when we started creating Tailwind UI, because it's something that like I could see myself using in my own projects, grab a form, start modifying that form, remove some HTML, add some more HTML, change some colors, change some padding, whatever it is that you need to do. But at least you have this really awesome, really well-designed component to start with. So we have, yeah, we have a couple designers on, obviously on our team. Uh, Steve Shoger is the one who's done a lot of the design early on and in, in they're very gifted individuals and the components just like really look awesome. So yeah. And, and the, you know, kind of the benefit for us and, and really the benefit for the whole community is that Tailwind UI being a paid product is something that helps, you know, pay the bills for us and means that we get to invest more time into Tailwind and the whole ecosystem, which has really created some really cool opportunities in terms of like how far we could take this, this open source project that, you know, initially me and Adam, when we first built it, we weren't really sure if anyone would ever use it. And here we are now, I looked the other day and it has been, it's been installed over 40, more than 40 million times, which is just mind boggling to me. Yeah, no, congrats. I mean, that's, that's pretty incredible, um, incredible uh, growth of the tool and in, in what is often considered a very noisy space of you know, so many front end tools out there to kind of break out as one of the, the leaders is, is pretty impressive. So yep. congrats on that. Um, yeah, I appreciate I'm curious, that. curious, a couple questions I had um, on the concept of some of these components that you get with Tailwind UI, like for example, a form, do you also include like JavaScript around some of the things that everyone does in a form, like validation and states of, um, that require JavaScript, or is that something you leave up to developers to implement in their frame? You know, if you're building React or Vue, you kind of let them implement it themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So we, so that's always a tricky line to draw to kind of know what we should be doing and what we should leave out of Tailwind GUI. As a general principle, what we're trying to find, like what we try to deliver is in Tailwind GUI specifically is the visual is the visual components. So for instance, uh, for a form, um, we will handle kind of whatever makes sense to handle in HTML. So if it's a form um, that would potentially have an error message, like we'll show, like we have examples of how to do error messages, but we don't necessarily um, try to implement any of the server side validation. Of course, that uh, you know, there's, you could use Tailwind UI with, with really any server-side solution out there. So that's not really somewhere that we try to fix or try to something that we try to solve. We also, I think if, if it, there, we, we'll put basic validation. So if it's like an email input, like we'll make sure that we actually have an email, you know, uh, email, like making an email input so that you get that basic, you know, client-side validation. But really that's kind of as far as we take it. And we, we really let, the idea is that a developer can take the component, take the HTML, and then wire it up within their own application in whatever way that makes sense. Be it that they're, if you know, whether they're working with React or if they're working with Vue, or if they're just working with plain old HTML in, in a server side framework like Rails or Laravel. And I'm also curious, you know, when we were talking about um, some of the downsides of Bootstrap, having to like have all these global variables that you tweak to to change things, it got me thinking of like. There are some areas in even a modern application where you, you know, folks often want global variables like colors or fonts. 
Um, does Tailwind have an opinion on how you do those, um, both in kind of core Tailwind and Tailwind UI when you have more kind of um, out of the box styling that would be affected by those things? Yeah, so um, absolutely. So the cool thing on the Tailwind side is, which we haven't really touched on, one of the really, really neat things of Tailwind CSS is that we have this, it is, it's extremely customizable. So we have this file called the tailwind.config.js file, which allows you to basically override almost all sort of the colors and fonts and font weights and sizing scale, like margins, paddings, um, border radiuses, and the kind of list goes on and on and on. So Tailwind ships with like a really, really good sensible um, default config. But this is this is what makes Tailwind so neat. You can you can publish that file, and then when you generate your CSS, you can go in there and say, well, you know, Tailwind's red color scale doesn't really fit our brand. So you can literally just remove the red color scale and use your own red color scale. Um, and 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 basically all these utilities that then get generated are based on your own config and not the Tailwind defaults. So. In reality, I would say that a lot of people try to stick with the defaults because they are a good, sensible default. But then as you need to make tweaks, so like the common ones really are colors because brand, you know, you have your own brand, you have your own brand colors, you, you want to use those. Fonts are another really common one. Every project, you know, you maybe uses different fonts so you can tweak those. Um, and then from there, you know, the changes maybe become less common. Um and especially, so the thing to get maybe get a little bit into the weeds on the technical side of things, prior to a more recent version of Tailwind, where we introduced a just a just in time mode, where we generate classes on the fly. Previously, what we had to do is we took the config, we read all the values, and then we generated a a big massive CSS file of all the possible values. Uh, and then from there, you could you, you we would do something called purging, and what that would do is go through and get rid of any of the styles that you don't want. Um, but not everyone knew how to purge, and not everyone used purging. So we were always like really kind of like concerned, like are people like shipping too big of a CSS file? Because in reality, Tailwind makes it really easy to ship a super small CSS file. Because once you purge away the the classes you don't use, you're ended you end with just these like this really nice subset of CSS uh, that tends to be extremely small, like um, way smaller than what you'd get with say something like Bootstrap, which has to ship everything in it. But anyway, with this new just in time mode, we now can ship like even more options with Tailwind and more utilities kind of with no expense because this purging happens on the mat automatically on the fly. So things like the, the scales, like margins and padding and, and stuff like that, where we were maybe a little bit more nervous to like ship a whole bunch of different options previously because of the size can, you know, issue. Uh, we're now, that's like a total non-issue because everything just gets purged automatically and we don't have to worry about that anymore. So yeah, so TLDR, Tailwind's extremely customizable and the way it does it is just very, very natural. And it feels like you you just have this config file and it feels, it doesn't feel like, well, if I'm making one little tweak here, it's going to break a whole bunch of things over there. Um, it's it's a it's much a much better customization experience. So that all said, that's all on the that's all on the Tailwind CSS side of it. On the Tailwind UI side of it, it's a little bit trickier because Tailwind UI, when we build those components, we have to build it obviously knowing that a certain that a certain number of classes are available, a certain number of utilities are available. So we've built Tailwind UI in such a way that it relies basically on the default um, Tailwind config. And then in any situation, so maybe you have a component, maybe we have a component in Tailwind UI that adds some unique color or has some unique font style or something like that. When, when, whenever that happens and it strays kind of from the default Tailwind config, we say, hey, just so you know, you're going to have to add this into your config or, you know, make this change here. And then, you know, the person who wants to implement that component goes to the tailwind.config.js file, adds that little customization, and now that component will work as well. Yeah, well, well thanks, Jonathan. I mean, it's been super interesting learning about Tailwind. Um, let's move on a bit to inertia. So this is another tool you created 
Um, could you, I think inertia is maybe a little bit less well known at this point than Tailwind, so maybe you could give folks a quick introduction um, to, to what it does. Yeah. All right. So um, inertia. Yeah. How do I introduce this? <laughs> uh, switching gears in my head here a little bit. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. So inertia. My the goal with inertia basically is to allow developers to build single page applications without building an API. Like that's kind of how I always like, that's kind of like the, the elevator pitch for inertia, but there's kind of a lot more to it than that. Um, and the way I like to often describe it is kind of like more from like how it came to be. Cause I feel like it's maybe under easier to understand that way. So what I was doing so I'm primarily a, a PHP developer and I work in the framework. Uh, I work with the Laravel framework a lot on my own projects. And on the client side, um, I historically have used Vue, although I these days I'm using more and more React. Um, but that was kind of like, that was the way I would build web applications historically. And in the Laravel ecosystem, when you're building a web app, what you do is it's a lot Maybe, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with Rails at all, but like, a lot of people are familiar with Rails and the ERB templates, so kind of compare it to that. You you server-side render all your HTML, and then you ship that to the browser, right? And it works the same way in Laravel with what are called blade templates. So what you do is you'd create all your routes in your server-side framework, um, kind of like that classic monolith approach. And then anytime you needed more interactivity, then what I would do is I would basically drop in view components as I needed them into my, into my web application or my website. And what I, and, and that worked pretty good, right? Cause I had the whole thing server side rendered with uh, blade and Laravel, but then whenever I needed more interact, more interactive pieces, I would drop in view components and I would actually drop them right in as like components within the, the HTML of the blade template. And then when the JavaScript actually run, then Vue would pick it up and those components would become, you know, enabled. Uh, so there was kind of like two main issues with this approach that I found. And I did this, I used this approach for years. Um, the one main issue is when those Vue components, when they initialize on a server-side rendered page, because it has to wait for the JavaScript to load and run, there was always like this little annoying flicker and it was like totally, there was like techniques where you could like hide the flicker, like or hide the component until it was ready. And you know, there was techniques you could use to make that flicker less annoying, but it was very much just like a problem that existed because of the architecture. So that was kind of like one thing that always bugged me. And then the other thing that I think in the end bugged me more was that I, my HTML lived in kind of like two different paradigms. Like one was like in, blade kind of this server side, um, templating engine. And then the rest of my templates lived in view or react a very much like modern JavaScript sort of approach to like using components and stuff like that. And it really like got annoying jumping between the two. And sometimes I'd be like, okay, I'm on this particular page right now. Maybe it's got a table on it and it has a drop or I want to add a drop down. And I'd be like, oh shoot, this is a server-side render template. I can't just add a dropdown because I know a dropdown is going to require some JavaScript and maybe there's some state and different things like that. And it's like, okay, so then for the next half an hour, I would then be converting my, my server-side rendered blade template into a view component so that I had like the whole thing in a page component that I could then do whatever I needed to do within Vue. So what ended up happening in my own particular SaaS application is more and more my server side rendered my server side templates more and more started getting converted to client side view components and my so then on the server side i would have a page template like a, a blade page template that all it was is a single component which was the view component so that kind of had had me thinking like well this is weird like i i have this weird pointless in between step where all i'm doing on these pages is outputting a view template and it still suffered from this these other issues where like, you know, that view template would take a second to render and different things like that. So then kind of add into this mix is I like the idea. I like the feel of single page applications, just a snappiness of not having to do a full page visit to get to the next page. And I had used for, for quite some time, a, a tool 
from the Rails folks called TurboLinks. And TurboLinks, uh, just a real quick description of it, what it does is it's like it sits on the client side and little piece of JavaScript. And what happens is anytime you click a link, it basically intercepts that link click. So maybe you're on the dashboard and you go to the users page, but you click on the users page link, it intercepts that. And then what it does is actually makes a request itself to the server, uh, you over XHR and gets the HTML back from the server. So just like it would, if it, if it hadn't intercepted and then what it does is it dynamically swaps the body content out, you know, from the previous page to the new page and updates the URL to the whatever page that you were going to. And that was really kind of a, a really unique technique that the Rails folks came up with because it was like, you just dropped it in and it kind of just worked. The problem is it just worked until it didn't work. So a lot of people in the end, like kind of hated turbo links because it, it promised that like, there was like, there's no work install you install and it just works. But there's actually all sorts of like annoying situations where things break. But the point that I, the thing for me was that I actually really like that experience of just saying, I want to make a link and I don't want it to be a full page visit. I would love it to just be made over XHR, but then there's all these issues with, you know, with turbo links with how it handles things. And in particular around JavaScript, like for example, bootstrap, sorry, not bootstrap view and turbo links did not play well together at all. And it's like, because they're like radically different paradigms, like turbo links was designed to work for an application that's completely server side rendered where I had these server side render pages that were combined with view templates, these view page components or, or even smaller components. And then I was using turbo links and things kind of just broke down anyway. So that's the whole background. So where, where inertia came from was me thinking, well, what if I didn't render, what if I didn't make any of my templates in my application, if I didn't make any of them in blade anymore, if I didn't server side render any of them, because for me, the ideal was I would love to build my entire client side part of my application. I would love to do it in Vue or React because that way, anytime I need to add any sort of interactivity, I have the full power of JavaScript at my disposal. And in particular, the full power of Vue or React, which are massive communities with all these amazing plugins and everything else. So I really, really like the idea of being able to build my whole application that way. And, and, and then... I thought, well, what if instead of returning HTML back like TurboLinks does on subsequent requests, what if Inertia could be smarter about it? And when it makes its request on subsequent, you know, after kind of like when you go into SPA mode, the single page app mode, what if it, instead of returning HTML, only returned the information necessary for Viewer React to swap to the next page component? So, and that's what it does. So what happens is like you land on an inertia site and it boots up kind of the initial like uh, render, which loads kind of like the root template that has like your HTML, uh, you know, your, your assets and, and kind of like that HTML um, element with kind of like the, the skeleton, if you call it that. And then what happens is viewer react boot within that and kind of load the initial page that you're on, but then any subsequent page visits that you make. So any link clicks you make. So again, using going from the dashboard to the user's page, with Inertia, when you click on the user's page link, what happens is Inertia makes a request back to the server. And then there's there's an, an Inertia adapter that actually gets installed on the server side. So Laravel has an, an, an Inertia adapter. Rails has an Inertia adapter. Anyway, it returns a JSON response back, not an HTML response back. And that includes three key pieces of information. One, the name of the JavaScript page component that you're going to be going to to the props or the data that's required for that page. So imagine the users page, the page component might be like slash users slash page dot view and the props or the data might be all the users that you want, want to list on that page. And then three, the URL that you want, you actually ended on. So slash users. And then what happens is client side, it dynamically swaps it out. It dynamically swaps out the current page component. So the dashboard page component with this new page component and, and frameworks like Vue, React and Svelte have this concept of dynamic components where it's like really easy to swap the, an existing component out with a new one. And then what inertia does is it updates the history state so that you have the right history, reset scroll position and does a few other things like that. So 
that's like a long drawn out way of kind of explaining how I got there. But it was really, that was really the evolution. That's really kind of how it happened because I was like struggling with like this really simple problem. Like I don't like having this mix of templates on in my application. I'd love to just do it all in one language and or one templating language. And to me, the obvious choice there was view or react because I want to build like these really rich client side applications where I can do all this kind of interactive stuff. That's just, is not possible with plain old server side rendered HTML. And, and then I wanted this single page app experience and, and inertia kind of just took all the existing tools that are, you know, were already in place and kind of just leveraged them in a lot of ways. Inertia is like the simplest little library ever. It's kind of like this, just this little piece of glue that lives between your server and your client. And it's just passing this, this data back and forth between the server and the client. Um, the best, you can almost think of it as like a really, really light client side routing library, except unlike say view router or react router, um, there's no routes being defined client side. Like all your routes are still defined in your server side framework. Um, so yeah, there's kind of a, like a lot of layers. I call it the modern monolith, which is to say that like historically, if you wanted to build a single page application using view or react, if you looked around online, the way that everyone would tell you how to do that is they would say, well, if you want to build a, re, a, an S, a view SPA or a react SPA, what you need to do is you got to go off and build an API first. So either a rest API or a GraphQL API and and that's, that's fine. Like there's absolutely times where that makes sense to do that. Like maybe if you have an iOS app and an Android app and a web app and you know, who knows what else that might actually make sense. But for so many of the projects that I was working on, I didn't want to have like to build a whole separate API. I really just love that classic monolith experience like rails or Laravel allows you to have, where you create a route that route has a controller. That controller gets some data from the database using Active Record or whatever your favorite ORM, ORM is, and then passes that data to a template. And to me, it was just kind of in, it just felt insane that if I just wanted to have a fully view or React um, based front end, that the only answer to that was, well, you got to build an API. You got to, you know, you got to learn OAuth. You know, if, and OAuth is not fun to learn. It's not fun to work with at all. And again, those tools have their place. But with like inertia, like it just massively, massively simplifies the whole process. Um, it feels like really you keep your entire monolith application with the exception that you don't use blade templates or you don't use ERB templates anymore. And all you do instead is you create view or react or Svelte page templates. That's really what it feels like. So it's the learning curve is, is so low because it just already, it's just, it, it feels like you're just building an application the way you always have in these server side, you know, monolith frameworks. Yeah, that, that all makes a lot of sense. I, I feel like some of the problems you described that led you to solve, solve them in the way of building inertia are similar to what led to um, Next.js and Gatsby kind of the, that exact fact that like in, having this completely monolithic front end that doesn't have the advantages of server side generation, server side rendering. Um, and, and, and so Gatsby and Next have kind of solved that problem by letting you build a modern React front end, do server side rendering where it makes sense, static site generation where it makes sense. So I'm curious what you think of those approaches and um, maybe some overlap or some differences with inertia. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's, those are always interesting compa to compare to. So I would say like historically, uh, this is changing with more recent versions of next GS, but historically what Nux and next offered was, um, was kind of like the API approach that I was talking about just a moment before, where if you wanted to build a Nux app or if you wanted to build a next GS app, and you needed to get data for that application, you still needed some server-side framework like Rails or Laravel where you went off and built an OAuth-based like Gra or GraphQL REST API. That was historically the story. Now that's ironically is changing and it's funny to see how things change, but like Next.js now is offering 
more and more ways where you can like get data, even from a database directly from within your next JS application. So, but like ignoring that fact, I would say like that was the big quote unquote issue for me with using Nux or Next. It's like, okay, great. I, I, I love, like, I love like Next. We use Next all the time, actually, even at Tailwind Labs. Uh, and it's an, it's an awesome framework and I think it's, it's going places for sure. Um, but it did mean you still needed to build this API. You still had like this data problem that you needed to solve one way or another. And if you just wanted to have a, you know, quote unquote, simple monolith application with routes and controllers, you know, use an active record to get some database, some information from a, a MySQL database, it still felt like a leap, you know, especially if you historically have been a Rails or Laravel developer that was like, you know, there was a whole bunch of extra knowledge that was required, even like the client side routing. And of course, like Next and Nux do a good job with the way they handle the routing side of things. But again, that routing is now handled in those frameworks and not say in Laravel or Rails. So that's the one big difference. And I think the other thing that's interesting is that Nuxt and Next are their JavaScript, their node frameworks. This is what they are. Uh, whereas there's lots of people using other tools um, and many, many other uh, languages and frameworks that maybe they're not comfortable in the JavaScript ecosystem quite in the same way or in the node ecosystem. And that's what's really neat about inertia. Inertia allows people to continue to work with whatever server-side framework they know really, really well. So for me, that was Laravel. For, for others, that's Rails. But we have we have adapters for all sorts of different frameworks and languages. So Python and Django. Uh, there's someone that made a, believe it or not, a cold fusion adapter. I didn't even know cold fusion was still a thing. So there's a yeah. cold fusion adapter. There's people who've made adapters for WordPress and Go and Clojure and ASP.net and Flask and, you know, all these different server side tools. And so I think for people who've been working in a particular ecosystem and, you know, let's, let's carry on with the Laravel example. There's so much that just knowledge you have after working with a tool like that for years and years and years to say, well, you know, I want to create my app using Vue or React. So I like, I like that client side experience. Um, because I like that client side experience, someone says, okay, well you should use next, for example. So I've been built, say I've been building Laravel for five years and I have all that knowledge, right? But now I want to build a, a React front end. It's like, well, okay, you know, maybe you got to go use a tool like Next. But, you know, with Next, so either you are now in a position where you have to build an API to get that data to bridge, or you build it all in Next. And now you got to learn how to connect to it. How do you connect to a MySQL database in Node? Like a Laravel developer probably doesn't know that. You know, that's, that's something they're going to have to learn. Or how do you throw a job onto the queue in Node or in Next, you know how do you send an email in Node and Next? How do you do any? How do you import and parse a CSV file? Like, and I, this list goes on and on and on. There's so much knowledge that you tend to just learn working in a particular ecosystem that it's a shame to have to throw that all away just because you want to build your client side using this JavaScript tooling that you know, like Vue, React, or Svelte. So I really a huge, huge goal with me with inertia was to say, yeah, we will help you move the client side of part of your application, the HTML from being server-side rendered and kind of all the limitations that come with server-side rendering. And we'll allow you to like, we'll create a really nice system for you to create those using Vue, React, and Svelte, but you can stick with that server-side framework you know and love and that you can work so fast in. So that's kind of how I would answer that, that question. I think it's it's, it's not that those tools are bad and it's not even that you can do less in the tool and that inertia offers more. It's more about who's the developer, what knowledge do they know and, you know, what's kind of the, the, the best way for them to kind of make a, a, a better application using Vue or React without kind of like dropping all this institutional knowledge that they already have. So we're almost out of time. Um, I want to end by talking about what's kind of on the roadmap, both for Tailwind, maybe we start with Tailwind and then we can talk about inertia after. So what are you most excited about that the Tailwind team is building both for Tailwind CSS and Tailwind UI? Yeah, so on the uh, Tailwind front, like the big thing that we have our eyes on right now is Tailwind version three. And with that, 
is um, the just in time. So the JIT mode enabled by default. So that for us is like a huge, huge milestone that we're going to reach where we kind of go from this ahead of time compilation to this just in time compilation and all the amazing benefits that come out of that. So that's really the big, big exciting thing. And, and along with that, we're doing a, a whole refresh to the brand and the website. So it's all going to look uh, a little bit more polished. So we're deep into that right now, which is super exciting. So 3.0, hopefully land before, uh, or at least the alpha before 2021 is out. Um, and then on the Tailwind UI side, we just launched a huge update to that. So historically, there was kind of like two pieces to it. Uh, one piece was the marketing uh, components, which are components that are designed to help you build like marketing websites, like pricing pages, uh, home pages, um, about pages and different things like that. And then the second one, the other one that we had was application UI, which was all like all the kind of the building blocks that you need to build some sort of web app, you know, forms, input buttons and all that kind of stuff, page layouts and that. But uh, a number of weeks ago, but I don't know if it's maybe four or five weeks ago now, we added a third one, which was something that tons of people were asking us for. And that was a key, an e-commerce bundle, which kind of has everything that you'd expect to have uh, in order to build a nice looking e-commerce website from product pages to shopping carts to, um, yeah, doing reviews or order summaries and checkout forms and kind of all that kind of stuff. So that's the exciting, you know, latest and greatest thing on the Tailwind UI front. On the inertia front, uh, there's, yeah, let me think here. So the, the big, big thing that we solved kind of this year that we're, it's currently in early access, but we're rolling out is server-side rendering. So even though Inertia is a client-side rendered, uh, you know, because it uses Vue, React, and Svelte, it's all client-side rendered, we've come up with a way to still offer server-side rendering so that uh, when you are uh, when you visit a page for the first time, so if it's a public-facing page, it'll actually generate in the background your page component. It'll convert it from Vue or React and actually generate on the fly the HTML, which is important for like SEO purposes in particular. So server-side rendering is something we, we've we added and that's that's coming soon. And the other thing that I've been working on is this really, really crazy dialogues feature, um, which will help you make modals more easily. If you've ever built modals, uh, <laughs> you know that they can be a really tricky thing to get right. Um, and obviously with, Inertia today, it's it's easy to build modals because Vue and React, you know, it makes it really easy to show and hide a modal. But what we wanted to add is the ability for modals to have their own history state and endpoints and stuff. So that's something we're adding to Inertia that I'm really excited about because it's, uh, yeah, it's a tricky thing to do right now if you want to have history state or have a modal have its own URL or endpoint. Uh, so that's the other thing that I'm working on there. And there's a few more kind of like edge casey things, but uh, those are kind of the big things that I'm pumped about right now. Awesome. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. It's been awesome to learn about Tailwind and Inertia. Um, and uh, yeah, really excited about the future roadmap for both products. Awesome. It was, uh, yeah, it's always fun for me to be here. And I always love talking about these things. They're, <laughs> they're near and dear to me. So I, as you can tell, I'm able to like... Uh, I'm able to ramble on about them pretty good. So yeah, <laughs> thanks for having me.